This is the Rugby Odds, where an unlikely pundit panel of a wordsmith, a WWE legend, a rugby star, and a supermodel scour the globe, seeking best bets and bad behavior. Are you not entertained? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. But we have a big show. We have a really big show. And in the sponsor opportunity green room, once again, you'll see WWE Hall of Famer turned rugby advocate John Bradshaw Layfield. You'll also see King Gifte Bailu, the inventor of words, as they prep behind the scenes for another big show. And that big show, as you can see by the Your Company name here, Slate, is chock full of good stuff. We also have George Hook waiting in the wings. So let's bring in John and Gift. Gentlemen, 29 and 16, the three of us, which is pretty good considering everything uh, that we have to consider in, in these these matches on who's going to play where, what rosters, everything else. Considering everything we have to consider. Considering everything that we have to consider is, is considerable. Is English your second language? I am sorry? <laughs> okay, look. All right, I'm not perfect. Okay, John, you can. No take one on this show has accused you of that. I had a good week. What do you want from me? I I, I was what eleven and four on the week. You? <laughs> why why are Gift and I here? If you're just gonna sit here and try to do a soliloquy about yourself, why are we here? I bear I guarantee when George Hook comes over here, you won't even listen to his questions and ask Back. the same question that he just answered. I guarantee that'll happen. <laughs> Point made. Okay. We were good all together, but we do have the business of the wooden spoon, and you get the wooden spoon this week. Thank you. End of story. Let's move on. John, your head was about to explode a couple of times over the weekend because of red cards and disallowed tries. Do you want to uh, uh, elaborate? Yeah, look, I, I hate the idea of the red card. Not the idea that something has to be penal, but you had an instance uh, in the Bristol game. This was going to be a really good game. And in 10, 15 minutes into it, a guy gets a red card. Referee says it's intentional. You cannot judge intent, especially in that one. He wasn't looking at the player. He stepped on his head. Not sure if he was even reckless. But – it's too penal to give put a guy out for the entire game. It robs the fans of seeing the game that they came to see because now one team is not only a player short, but potentially a star player short. I think they need to go to the Major League Rugby model and just go 20 minutes for a red card and then let him come back in. If it's that bad, hey, give him 20 minutes and throw him out. Uh, if it's flagrant and intentional and you can deem it that way, throw him out for the rest of the game, let somebody else come in in his place in either 10 or 20 minutes. Well, I mean, that's what the MLR does with the red card. That guy's gone permanently, and he's up for review for a further suspension, and the team plays for 20 minutes shorthanded. But there's one correction I want to make. You said the Bristol game. It was the <laughs> Connacht game, okay? It was in Galway. It wasn't in Bristol. It was the <laughs> Connacht game. What are you mad at? You're not even Irish. You're from New Jersey. <laughs> Who was man of the match for Leinster? Joe McCarthy. Who's my godfather? Joe McCarthy. Layfield. There was a John Layfield that wrote part of the King James Bible. <laughs> I have no idea who that person is, and I'm not related to that person, and I don't claim that person because just because they happen <laughs> no, to have just, the same you call a game entire name, tonic. entire name is me. Whatever you call a game in Galway played by Connacht, who's hosting a team from Bristol, and you call it the Bristol game. I don't care what you call it. What I call it is a disaster that you have a red card and a player goes out. And fans, both in Connacht and fans watching from Bristol, want to see the star matchup. They want to see the best against the best. And when you take a player out for the entire game, it's just too penal. Gift, you got anything to add? Look, I think the only thing for me I, it has been just, once again, I talk about the rise of South Africa and inclusion into this European Cup. I, For me, I, I looking at what we see with the Bulls and everything like that, I said it last week, and I'll say it again. The best version of rugby that's being played, even whenever you say the heat, which in reality, it, it really wasn't that hot. It was only like 80 degrees. That's it's nothing. You know, even with 50 percent humidity, it's nothing. And the stadium was basically empty. So you like oh, the heat atrocious. is mitigated even more. <laughs> so like even that being said, like you're talking about a team that is absolutely coming into Europe and going to completely wipe through. And I think they're better than the Stormers, in my humble opinion. I feel like they're better than the Stormers. The Bulls. The Bulls. I agree with you. I think South Africa is a different level of rugby, and this is what's so great about this competition. you got three teams 
that are undefeated in this competition, all from the three different leagues. You got Leinster, Toulouse, and Northampton. Two of the South African teams are three and one. South Africa has changed the dynamic. You got some great teams in the top 14, some great teams in the premiership, some great teams in the European portion of the URC. South Africa has changed this completely and made it a much better competition. This was a wonderful week of rugby. And the the top 16 going all the way to number two, I know we're going to upset a little bit about the draw, but so what? These teams are great, and there's going to be some great rugby coming up. Just playing the devil's advocate for a second. Bordeaux lost by six points. 46-40 46-40 in those conditions, which they were not accustomed to. Bordeaux and some of these French teams are playing unbelievable rugby. Toulouse was just clinical, and you can't write off these teams. You guys are just talking about these South African teams. What if that game was played in France? I, I do think that there is a different level of, of play. And humidity or not, France gets humidity too, even though it's Paris. They get it, like it's unless the you're winter saying in that France right now. So unless you're saying like their power comes in the advantage of being too cold, they're still at the mercy of the Bulls. They're playing in what's basically the best weather for rugby, plus water breaks. You know what like, this is? This is bull. <laughs> That's what this is. Oh, what a snowflake! What an absolute <laughs> snowflake! Oh my goodness, we got to go down and play in the heat. Poor, tough rugby players. These guys are professional athletes, some of the toughest guys Boom. on the planet. They're going Damn. down, the sun's out. They're going to feel great about that. Not bad. And no one's dismissing the rest of the teams. I think Leinster at home. You two have your noses so far up these South uh, African no, teams. No, no, you're, no. Yeah, you're trying to make stuff up so you can get on your little troll wagon. <laughs> Leinster, Leinster at home. Leinster at home is almost unbeatable. I mean, one of these yeah. South African teams, the Bulls are stormers. They better hope they get them down in South Africa and not in Leinster because that, that is a tough – Heel to climb. You know, you you thought the same thing about Munster. Northampton goes in there and wins it, but France is different. I mean, these teams at home in in France play a different rugby than they do on the road. Well, Toulouse has been playing well on the road. They are no joke. And Bordeaux has been playing well on the road. But I'm talking about when they have to play a top game, one, one win, one out, knockout phase. When you're talking about different hemispheres, home field advantage is going to mean several points. It's going to be enormous in this competition. And, you know, well, I just said, I just said that. <laughs> okay, f- face. We have to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Need a great price on a new vehicle? Sheehy makes it easy. Easy Price shows you our lowest prices on the Mid-Atlantic's largest selection. Find your best price online or at any of our 31 dealerships. It's easy at Sheehy. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle, on West 36th Street. And we're back, and once again, we're welcoming back George Hook. George, great to see you once again. Thanks very much. Come through. Yes, sir. George and us. Yeah. All right. If there was any doubt that the guys in charge of rugby are zombies, then this weekend proves that, right? They've spent the last four weeks beating the living daylights out of each other to qualify, right, (laughs) for the round of 16. Five of the eight matches are replays of matches that were in the earlier thing. So Leinster are now playing Leicester, except it's in Dublin. Munster are playing Northampton, except it's in Northampton. La Rochelle are playing the Stormers, I think, and it doesn't matter. Anyway, there are five repeat matches. What is the point? It's horse manure. Interesting that you say that because an idea put forth out on social media by Nick Mullins, he wanted it to all go in a bag and have the draw pulled out of the bag like they used to do in the old days. Well, I mean, I don't have an argument with that, except the whole point about the earlier matches was that the good teams would get home advantage. So I I get that there should be home advantage, but you could still have a bag. You could have a bag of eight teams for home teams and a bag of eight teams for away and draw it. I thought Mullen's idea was quite reasonable, but what you have at the moment is complete claptrap. Gift, you've been a little bit quiet over there. You got anything to say? I mean, right now you guys are are, are talking anything that wasn't uh, the uh, the Bulls absolutely showing out this week and just South Africa coming up right now is not my conversation. 
because those are the places that have me the most interested right now. George and Giff, both of you, tip of the cap, because, George, you talked up Bordeaux. They went down to South Africa and played a hell of a match and a, in a six-point mm-hmm. loss. And Gift, your boys, they came through. 86 points in hot temperatures where they had the parasols that Bordeaux brought out. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I think we need TRO parasols. Don't forget, like, that one of the dark horses, I think, based on last weekend, is La Rochelle. Now, putting sail sharks to the sword isn't the most difficult thing in the world, but they were very impressive, I thought. It started slow in the top 14. It started slow in this championship. I think they're impressive. Also, it's really sad for me. No Italian teams. Okay, we buy that. No Welsh teams qualify. I mean, it's this game was part of the tradition of it was the guys coming up from the pits, you know, the mining pits in South Wales and, and playing rugby and the church in which singing Richard was Burton. so important. And, and singing was so important to Welsh rugby. All that that I grew up with. And they can't get a team to qualify. Now, look, nobody knows this except me. So what I'm telling you is just between us. <laughs> right, New Hampshire, Nikki Haley, Donald Trump, and Joe Schmidt are in the shakeup. He brought up Joe Schmidt. <laughs> you beat me to the punch. You beat me to the punch, George. How happy are you that Joe Schmidt is back in the headlines as the head of Australia, the Wallabies? How happy? Well, I, I promised myself that I wouldn't make the same error I made about the last coach to Australia Ooh. where I got into a lot of trouble. So, look, <laughs> I have not liked Joe Schmidt since <laughs> the second game in charge of Leinster. I've never, <laughs> ever rated him as a coach, right? Now, we get carried away sometimes. When we look at Schmidt's, um, career and we say at Leinster they won this or they won a Grand Slam or whatever the heck it was. It is how they won it and what he did to adventure in Irish rugby. I mean, players were terrified to pass the ball. They came in on Monday and there was there was a horror show of a video saying, look, you passed the ball. You shouldn't have passed the ball. Ireland never passed the ball. Like Gary Ringrose, who is indisputably me, one of the great centers in world rugby today. Schmidt went down to South Africa and left Gary Ringrose at home. And he, he took down two very middle of the road, bash up the middle center. Young Madigan was an outstanding young fly half. He never got a chance. And Leinster continued to pick a fly half who was qualified for England, for crying out loud. And, and they never gave Madigan a chance. So they, they, what, what he did was he ruled, in my view, by fear. And he ruled by a very strict adherence to his game plan. That's fine. But he is now going down to a country which is I, where I think rugby is within a heartbeat of disappearing. Schmidt may well get a result, but what kind of damage will he do to the game? Oh, wait, wait, now, hold on a second. Hold on a second, because you know as well as I do that you're pissing off a lot of people in Ireland right now because they Joe Schmidt beat the All Blacks. Soldier Field, Chicago, same week the Cubs won the World Series. <laughs> the All Blacks, the, 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 the Irish did the unthinkable. They beat the All Blacks for the first time in 3,000 years. The Irish women beat the All Blacks before the Irish men did. And you're not talking about it. So look up your records <laughs> and start talking about the Irish women and who has coached the Irish women. You hook. <laughs> so, yeah, of course he did. I'm not denying he had success. I actually prefaced my remarks by that. Right, the perfect spin. Yeah, you should have listened, Matt. He just gaslighted me. What I'm saying is how he did it. Football, uh, not American football, not rugby football, but association football, soccer to the uninitiated, was always described as the beautiful game. I saw rugby as the beautiful game. 
like when you think how hard it is to score in rugby union, you have to pass the ball backwards to go forwards. There's no place in rugby union for Dan Marino who can throw the ball 75 yards to a wide receiver halfway down the pitch. Rugby union defence has always been, since Eddie O'Sullivan was in nappies, defence is to attack as two is to one. Defence in rugby union is a bit like the American Civil War. More men died in the American Civil War than all the wars subsequent. Why? Because defence was preeminent and he just walked straight into the rifles. So therefore, when to unlock that defence, you need coaches of real quality. And sadly, Joe Schmidt is not one of them, in my <laughs> opinion. So you, you brought up soccer to zing Eddie O'Sullivan and Joe Schmidt with a Civil War rant. That was beautiful. That was absolute gold. Absolute gold. So Joe Schmidt is a modern-day Stonewall Jackson. <laughs> I know. He's Sherman marching to Georgia, burning everything to see back. We have to take a quick break, guys. We'll be right back. You need your cleats? You need them tomorrow? If you order today by 3 p.m. New York time or noon L.A. time, they can have them to you tomorrow. Young, old, male, female, if you're playing on turf, if you're playing on grass, if you're playing in the rain, you're playing in the heat, they've got you covered. RugbyNow.com. Go there now. And we're back. All George, right, so I George. Ask, yeah. Before you say whatever you were going to say, Matt. I, I was going to say before you go, George, let's hear from Gift. <laughs> In the last week, two, we've officially made two major losses in rugby. We had Lewis Rezamit leave for the NFL, and Owen Farrell officially is now going to Rossing 92. Correct. For you, now with the Six Nations about to come up, and both of those players are out, both of those players are now leaving the Great Britain area in general, uh, where do you feel like the the power-breaking of rugby in England is going to be, in Great Britain, is going to be. The Farrell thing is interesting because he went public at the end of the World Cup saying he had mental issues. I, I don't think he necessarily is going to solve them, and I don't know, and I'm certainly no expert, by going to France. But if he's got a problem, which he says himself he has, he's better off out of London, he's better off out of Saracens, and he's better trying a new job. I'm, I'm good with it. But once you get into professional sport, irrespective of the sport, players make decisions based on money, not on other re reasons. Like I, if somebody offered me to spend a couple of years in Paris, walking up and down Champs Elysees at ten o'clock at night, they wouldn't have to pay me. I'd go in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> and George, with Farrell going over to France. Yeah. If he has a change of heart and suddenly gets reinvigorated and decides that he wants to play in the World Cup, the next one in 2027, would would they make an exception in England to allow him to come back? Because look at the, the situation with Jack Willis with T Toulouse. He dominated this weekend. He's exactly yeah. what England could use. And yet he can't play for the country again. Yeah, well, like we had that case with Johnny Sexton when he went to, uh, to Paris. I, I I think the idea of having the players, and this is why Ireland again have been so successful. They've got all the players at home. And if you want to go off somewhere, good luck to you, but you're not going to play for Ireland. And I think that's the strong point of the Irish game. And it was the biggest single decision they made at the very beginning. No, I wouldn't have Farrell back. I mean, they've got Marcus Smith for crying out. Yeah, that, that Finn with the kid from Northampton. Yeah, wow. Yeah, he could play the game. All right. Well, on that note, we're basically out of time. Did I ever tell you I lost my virginity in Northampton? <laughs> I'm sorry. Could you say say that again, George? <laughs> Did I ever tell you I lost my virginity in Northampton? No. And there's a great shoe firm. I bought rugby boots from them afterwards called the Barretts of Northampton. And I met this bird. Pamela was her name. Imagine. She's older than 
and she's blonde. I mean, I'm made, made. George should not let the country down. Oh, hell, George Hook. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he was my idol. He just got higher. On that note, thank you to George Hook. Go A hero. Thank you, George. <laughs> we'll be right back after this. From New York City comes America's longest running and most popular rugby show. The biggest names in Major League Rugby, MLR highlights, and big match previews. Rugby Wrap-Up presents MLR Weekly, made in New York City. And we're back. The Champions Cup is down for these teams to come back into their professional setups. There's only one match in the URC. The Premiership and the top 14 have a full slate. Japan's Rugby League One has four matches going instead of six. Two of their teams are playing against super rugby teams in this cross-border exhibition series. Let's just start with the URC. The Bulls hosting the Lions. The spread is 14 and a half Bulls giving it away. John, who do you like? This looks like a trap game for the Bulls. They play that incredible game against Bordeaux, 46-40. I don't see how it's not possible to have a letdown. I think it's too many points. I would take the Lions here at plus 14 and a half. You're right. You don't know if there's going to be a letdown or not. The Heat gift? Yeah, uh, you're about to talk about the Heat. I was going to be like, dismiss that. 100% humidity. <laughs> just stop. <laughs> but one thing I saw in the stadium last week was a lot of empty seats. And when you have a lot of empty seats, it's very difficult to get that rise up again whenever you're going against a team that by all intents and purposes is actually very inferior to them i do think the lions are going to come through on this one probably keep it within the point bulls are going to win so the lions are going to cover the spread but lose the there game there we go cover the spread okay you know the, they're making that classic mistake right it's a fifty-two thousand seat stadium which is way too big for these matches unfortunately in pretoria but they're also shooting the camera from above the fans that are actually sitting in the shaded side of the stadium and they're shooting the empty seats across the whole the whole stadium so it's not completely empty but it's certainly not near what they need to have in terms of a look on camera. 75% empty is still pretty empty. No doubt. I mean, there's what, 5,000 fans there in a 52,000 seat stadium? But if it was in a smaller venue, it'd be different. And if they shot. And, the and camera, presentation is so important. I mean, this league is doing a lot of things just perfectly right. They're just right. They, I think this, uh, the URC is doing a wonderful job. They need to shoot this. They need to shoot these games better when they have something like that to make the stadium look more full. And they've come a long way. I like the Bulls at home to cover. I, I think they're going to run them out of the park, and they're used to the heat because they they're down there, and it's their second week in a row at home. So I like the Bulls. Moving on, we've got the Premiership, a full slate. John, who do you like in the Premiership? But Quinns looked great last week. They always play great at the Stoops. Sarah, but Quinns is at home against Leicester. Leicester's a terrific team. But I think Quinns is on a roll, and I'm going to take Quinns at home, giving six and a half points. Gift? Look, I'm looking at Bristol versus Bath. And oh. look, Bath has been Bath. actually playing really, really well. Many would say this could be a trap game, but look, I look at Bath to be able to take this. Cover the spread. Bristol Bears ultimately fall. So you're, you're picking against A.J. McGinty now that he's back with Bristol. It's okay. Yeah. I'm going to pick my Saints, my Northampton Saints, to obliterate Newcastle. And the Saints will cover the spread. On to the top four team. John. Montpelier versus Powell. Powell played an incredible game last week against Zebre. Zebre scores the try. It, it, game is over. They missed the two-point conversion. Powell wins by a point. I think it's a natural letdown spot for Powell. That was a huge win for them. I'm taking Montpelier to defeat Powell. Gift. Ross 92 absolutely obliterated Cardiff. Again, putting another hammer to the Welsh Hopes and dreams again, but they're going against Toulouse. And Toulouse is going to be wanting to show up in top 14. Look at Toulouse to be able to cover. But I look at Rossing to probably take this game. But at seven and a half points, I think is a lot for Toulouse versus Rossing. I'm going to go with Castra at home. Minus six and a half versus Claremont. Claremont just absolutely sucks on the road. Then we have Japan Rugby League One. There's only four games, as we said. John, who do you like? If the local high school was playing Kitetsu Liners, <laughs> I would take the local high school. And they don't even have a rugby team. So give me Blue Revs to defeat the Kitetsu Liners. Would you pick a JV or a varsity high school team? I go varsity, but they don't even have a rugby team. So they actually have to find 
15 players. <laughs> Gift? Toyota Verblitz versus Brave Lupus. I told you the other week, Toyota Verblitz have become one of my favorite teams in Japan League One. Fast off the edge because they got that Fijian magic magician over there. Brave Lupus are perfect so far this season, but look for the Verblitz to come in with the upset and give that first loss to the Lupus. That's a big match. That's two versus five. Lupus in the second in the standings. Who would have thunk? I like yeah, the Lupus cannon. Took out Michael Jackson, so I believe in them going down to the Verblitz. Bam. All right. I like the Cannon Eagles versus the Kobe Steel in another tough match. Let's move on to sevens before we get to our picks of the week. Sevens in Perth, men's and women's. Let's pick the women's first. John, who do you like? America. Gift. Australia. <laughs> Me. Look, those women are ridic ridiculous. It's ridiculous. They're not going to win the Olympics, but they're ridiculous at home. All right, I'm going to go with uh, the intel that Steve Lewis gave us because he was in Chula Vista in Eagles camp, saw the men's and the women's teams right before they departed for Perth, spent the week there. He says the women look very good. I'm going with the women. How about the men's side, John? America. You're goddamn good American, John Bradshaw. If you gift. I'm going to give a quick shout-out to my girl, my friends, Naya and Chetta and all of them. For he's doing in Brazil, doing. ladies and gentlemen, and he's wearing green and yellow underneath that shirt. Hey, nothing going on, but I will say this. For the men's side, we got all the, the veterans coming back, but we need another tournament before they're fully in warm-up form. Argentina is going to end up taking this one in Perth because they're just they're on fire right now. And Argentina right. is literally about to be the empire in rugby over the course of this next five years. Yeah, Watch right. What ifs? I'm, I like the men's team to come in third, but that's not what we're picking here. So I'm going to pick New Zealand to win in Perth, but the USA, I think, will come in the top three because they got a puncher's chance. Picks of the week. John. Shout out to Maro Atoji getting a degree from the university. Congratulations, yes. Maro Atoji. Also, if you're in a line out and you're the opposing team and you see Maro Atoji out there, do not throw the ball near him. I promise you, he will poach it. And that being said, I thought Saracens played great last week. I think there's a natural letdown spot here. Exeter did not show up last week because they're looking forward to this game. Exeter playing at Saracens gets six and a half points. I'm going to take the points in Exeter. Toje had a big week getting that degree, getting two tries, carrying oh, his team in that amazing. second half. Gift. My pick of the week, the USA teams, USA women are going to finish top three in Perth Sevens, and men will finish top five. I actually think they'll be fourth overall, even if I don't think they'll be first. Fourth and third. I'm taking Ronan O'Gara and La Rochelle in Toulon. Toulon, for some inexplicable reason, is giving four and a half to La Rochelle. They're going to get destroyed. That's my take. And on that note, we're out of time. I want to thank John Bradshaw, Linfield, the WWE Hall of Famer, King Gift Day Bailu, the inventor of words, George Hook, the Irish legend who lost his virginity in Northampton. And thank you for tuning in. Please check out our other programs, including MLR Weekly and the College Rugby Wrap-Up. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube, sign up for our weekly newsletter, and please join our American Red Cross blood donor team.